Welcome to Rotary and Serving Our Community. Today's program is going to be a very special program, one that I thought would be of relevance and uh, actually very interesting for a lot of viewers out there. We're going to be talking about Rotary's largest international initiative, and that is also the greatest humanitarian project ever taken on by uh, mankind. I'm going to be talking about a campaign to eradicate polio. And part of the story is going to be how it's influenced me and my life and where I come from and how it worked in so well to my Rotary story. Polio is a virus, uh, a virus that is actually um, very, I'd say, detrimental and very durable. It could last 48 hours outside the human body um, before infecting somebody. And the virus itself, if it infects a child, that, could have, that person could have irreversible paralysis within 45 minutes of contracting that disease. That's why it is so important to have. It was huge uh, in our country, the United States, back in the 1940s and 1950s, but to date there are very few cases, and so a lot of people out there in our communities have no idea when we say we are fighting polio what that disease actually is. In the early, mid-1950s, um, I actually was contracted, uh, contracted the disease. I ended up having polio as a child of about four years old, not knowing what I had. I remember the doctor coming to see myself, myself and my mother at my house and thinking I had um, some sort of flu because of a high fever. We, I was later taken away to the hospital and put in quarantine, uh, isolation ward, where I was diagnosed with actually having polio as the disease. Well, I remember that, uh, this is as a four-year-old, how it affected myself back then. I remember going into the hospital. By the way, this was at St. Francis Hospital here in, California, in Santa Barbara. Sitting in this isolation room um, with only uh, a nurse occasionally coming in, and I remember those doors that they have at the hospital, those rectangular doors uh, with the windows in it where I could see in uh, and out through, through into the corridor. And I remember seeing my mother uh, outside. She couldn't come in. Uh, I couldn't talk to her. I couldn't go outside. And how traumatic that was to be that close yet not be able to touch her as a four-year-old. And I also remember that same door because I would watch that door open at least once a day where two to three attendants would come in with the doctor and they'd actually um, give me a spinal tap. And I remember to this day what that felt like. Um, fortunately for me, I have no uh, residual effects. I've been fortunate not to have what's called post-polio syndrome disorder where um, everything is functioning as normal as it should be. There are other people that have contracted this, this disease that have had all kinds of issues later in life. When I um, grew up, I quit thinking about it because I had, again, no residual effect. I played all the sports. I basically had a normal childhood uh, into adulthood. And it wasn't until I joined Rotary that I actually realized that polio was still prevalent in the world. And I told my wife, I said, you know, this is fascinating that I would go full circle and come back to looking at polio as a problem in this world. And I told her, I says, I want to do something about this. I want to go to India and actually immunize children and do the best I can, all I can, so other children around this world would never have to suffer the way I suffered, some of my friends suffered. So I signed up to go to uh, India. Uh, this is in 2010. Now, in 1979, Rotary, uh, a Rotary Club in the Philippines actually took on the project of eradicating polio from the entire country. They were very successful in doing this, and that later became a model that Rotary International would use. In 1985, they took on the initiative to actually go about eradicating polio from the world. At that time, 1985, there were 350,000 cases being diagnosed annually, actually a little bit greater than that. And this is one of the reasons why Rotary and polio worked so well together because we had the model, we had the manpower, we had the ability and the technology to make a difference. And that's why we took it on. The picture uh, that you'll see uh, next to me is a team that we took. This is the 2010 team that went to India. There's 25 of us there and the gentleman to the uh, extreme right of the picture, his name is Anil Garg. And Anil Garg has been doing this since 2000. Um, he worked with the governor, then Otto Estelle, and has gone every year since then. He has been on 16, we call them NIDs, or National Immunization Days. With this team, we are broken down into five, and the five-man teams would then go into the different cities 
to take a look at and uh, eradicate polio in those specific cities. My uh, assignment, I was one of the team leaders of the five, was to go to a city named Rampur. Well, I did some research before I went and uh, taking a look at it, I said, well, Rampur it sounds interesting. I Googled it and found out uh, the report back said, Rampur is a very interesting city. Uh, if you go there, don't drink the water, don't eat the food, and plan on not staying there because there's not a lot of accommodations. So I'm thinking to myself, well, this is going to be the true frontier. This is uh, India, state of Uttar Pradesh, which is one of the more frontier type of uh, states. Well, when I got to India, um, they actually, we got together as a team, and they asked me, who's going to uh, Rampur? So I raised my hand, said, I'm taking the team to Rampur. I'm the team leader. And the gentleman says, well, uh, we're changing your assignment. You're no longer going to Rampur. You're going to a city called Muradabad. And I'm thinking to myself, this is one great opportunity because I was definitely not looking forward to going to Rampur, not knowing what Muradabad was. Well, a gentleman next to me goes, you have the assignment to go to Muradabad. And I says, that is great. And I'm looking forward to it. And he goes, well, before you get too excited, I need to tell you, I was here two years ago. And at that time, two years ago, we went into the slums of Muradabad to immunize, immunize the children there. And we were actually chased out by the people in that community by having them throwing down honey buckets on us from the second and third floor. All I could think of, and by the way, I'm wearing what's called the NID jacket. It's the one that identifies us, thinking, well, I sure hope these are waterproof, and I hope the hood comes off because I'm going to need that if I'm going into the same community. That was, uh, I would say, the original opening part of, of my India trip. The picture that you see now is a picture of uh, the past international president. This is um, Kalyan Banerjee of India. And a gentleman next to him is Dr. Mohammed Arif Khan, who works with uh, not only the polio efforts, but also with the National Health uh, Organization of India. Uh, they're walking through one of the communities here. I wanted to show you this because this is what we were faced with. This is what India looks like, the areas that we are actually going into. This is the city of Muradabad specific. You can see it's uh, very hectic. Uh, there are 4.3 million people living in Muradabad, which is about the size uh, geographically of Santa Barbara. Um, very, very large area as far as population is concerned. I heard stories uh, from one of the people that lived there that were our guides. He said that the city is so overpopulated and the rent is so high that families would actually be in uh, a two, three-story building. They would live there and pay rent for eight-hour shifts. In other words, three families would actually live in these homes paying eight-hour shifts, and then they would have to go back out onto the streets. So you can imagine the, the life of what it's like in this city. Uh, I've been to a lot of slums, a lot of areas, uh, underdeveloped areas within the world. The one thing that fascinated me about this uh, area of the city of Muradabad and in these uh, neighborhood areas was that there are so many people. Slums look the same all over the world, but I've never seen so many people living in a slum. Uh, that's what really uh, caught my attention. You can see there's a yellow banner that crosses that road. That banner actually identifies um, us coming, the uh, polio immunization team coming. That banner was paid for by UNICEF, and that is part of the announcement, part of the uh, PR program that um, precedes us as we came in later on to do what we call the NID, the, the polio immunizations. Another picture, I happen to have my camera on my shoulder. I snapped this one. Around every corner, you have no idea what to expect. The roads are tiny. Uh, I can't believe more than one or two cars could pass those, even though they do. And then you, you run into this. <laughs> Uh, an, an oxen and a gentleman there running through the streets. This was not a slow trot. This was a run. And so we definitely had to jump out of the way for that. But this is India. India is a very, has a lot of life to it. And we really enjoyed that part of it. Uh, what we found fascinating was the fact that they are, again, just over impacted by people. I put this picture in because one of the first stops we had was a stop at a, um, a hospital. And at that hospital, that um, actually was one of the larger hospitals where they even do heart surgeries, brain surgeries, uh, 
cancer surgeries, you name it. It, it was a very um, well-developed hospital. This was in the side, and I asked, what, what's that cart for? And the answer was, people here can't afford to have ambulances come. It takes us too long, the roads are too narrow. So they actually take this cart out to bring in the patients to the hospital. Uh, I, I took a picture of that because there are about two or three of those that I actually did see coming in and out of those hospitals. So that's what you get. You get the mixture of uh, high technology, uh, very developed technology to something here that goes back to um, an older civilization, an older world. This is uh, the, one of the areas that we went into in the city of Moradabad. And you'll notice uh, I took this picture because it fascinated me. You have a bridge in the background that's coming forward. And that bridge actually brings in uh, what well, the plan was is to have it developed within the next four to five years back then for the uh, World Cup games that were going to be happening in India itself. And so that's the development coming forward, uh, kind of an eerie picture. And then in the foreground, you see the, uh, the people and also the water that's coming out. Now, the water actually is open sewage. That, those are uh, draining through the community. It is, uh, there's no infrastructure, or very little. Water is at certain stations themselves. And there is no sewer. That sewer, that water that you see right there, live, uh, live sewage, actually goes down to the river right next to it. And so this is what we are faced with. Now people go, why wouldn't you fix that? Why wouldn't this be a priority instead of actually trying to immunize children for polio? Well, we're looking at a 25-year process or more to get that infrastructure put in place. And we didn't have the time to go ahead and do that without immunizing children. We felt the priority was to immunize children, try and uh, get rid of the disease, and then as development goes forward, we could then address the infrastructure. This is uh, my team, the team that went with me to Muradabad. And this team we stopped at was called a uh, neighborhood clinic. It's actually a health clinic. And they're holding up um, different types of um, items that are going to go out to the children. You see, in developed countries, for example, in, in India and in Muradabad specific, children are immunized each and every year. However, some children, even with 12, 13, 14 treatments of uh, polio vaccines, were still contracting the disease. So the World Health Organization stepped in and found out, in fact, that these children were so malnutrition, uh, malnourished and so poor in health that even with the drops, it would go right through them. They would not be able to retain that long enough to get the benefits of that immunization. So the um, camps actually are out there to give these children, before we come in to do the immunization, electrolytes, vitamins, foods, uh, and medicines to take care of any of the ailments that they have. That way, with them being healthy, they'll be able to take in the uh, immunization and actually absorb that for, for the benefit. And this was one of the huge things that's happened within the last two or three years before we went there. So we're showing a picture here because these are part of the uh, items that actually are given to the children. This again is another picture uh, at one of the other uh, health camps. And each, by the way, each, I would say, city block or two city blocks has a health camp that gets out there probably six to nine months before we come in. They, they set up, quote, camp, and they go out to all of the neighborhoods and make sure that the children come in there on a daily basis. They're monitored to make sure that they are ready and healthy enough to get the immunizations. This picture here shows the children with the number two up. That uh, represents the two drops, the two drops of polio that we give to each of the children there, um, ages six year, uh, five years and under. So that is part of it, and that is part of the PR program of actually doing that is the number two. So everywhere you go, when they see us coming with the yellow jacket like the one I'm wearing, they will all go like this, saying, yeah, we are ready for the two drops of polio vaccine. This picture is a picture of us walking through a neighborhood as part of a, quote, parade. The parade is, again, part of UNICEF and part of the uh, PR uh, marketing campaign itself. This parade goes for sometimes five, six blocks and will go for literally miles. The parade itself is set up with children participating, bands participating, schools participating, and all kinds of dignitaries. The parade specific 
is to announce the coming of the polio immunizations. And we found out that this was huge as far as acceptance within that area. And we do this the day before each of the um, immunization processes are put in place. It's, it's a huge, huge uh, deal. And um, music, you can hear music uh, three, four blocks away. They're definitely loud also and, and, and amplified. The ladies here are working another one of the health clinics. This is on one of the days we went there. The time of day was about two o'clock in the afternoon. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, the four that they're putting up indicated how many children that they had immunized in that given day, that day at two o'clock. Four indicating there were over 400 children immunized by this, by this group of three women. Uh, it was amazing, astounding. I could not believe that they can get that many children immunized. We got there at 2 o'clock and there's only one or two children still left to do. One thing fascinating, and I talk about these uh, different uh, camps, the, the health camps themselves, is that at the end of each day, I was privileged to go to um, the India Health Center where they have a meeting with all of the different groups in the different regions of Maradabad. There was about 11 or 12 gentlemen there that were in charge of specific neighborhoods. And at the end of the day, each of them makes a report. How many children were immunized? How well and how successful they were? And uh, Dr. Muhammad Arif Khan, who was my guide, says, you need to pay attention to this because this is what's going to be the success of India and how it's going to go away. And I go, well, could you tell me? He goes, no, you have to watch this. Well, I watched each person give their report. One person did an outstanding job. He ended up being the highest person. He got a standing ovation from this group, including the doctors. The National Director of Health of India was actually there on site, and they commended him for that. They went to the next person, same kind of thing happened, and then they came to a person that had the lowest count. It was about half of what the, the highest one was. He got booed by the entire group, and along with that, he was reprimanded by the um, by the director, the director of health, saying, if you don't do your job, India will suffer. This is on your shoulders if we cannot get rid of this disease that you did not do the best you could do. Your effort is substandard. If you can't do your job, we are going to replace you. That is the accountability. I was surprised uh, in all, actually, about how they seriously took that job. This is a picture of my wife and Dr. Muhammad Arif Khan. We were invited to actually uh, participate in a women's prayer group. Now, men weren't allowed to go in. Uh, my wife went in and all of the women of our team were invited in, but they had to wear the scarves over their head as part of the, uh, the tradition, the culture, which they were happy to do. Later on at the end of the prayer session, they invited us in also and thanked us for what we were doing there in that, in that place. In the center, is the um, Shiite leader. He is the imam of all of uh, Muradabad. There were seven different religious groups of uh, Islamic groups in that area. And what we found out later on, the team that was chased out a few years before that was actually taken on by part of uh, an Islamic faith group. This gentleman here single-handedly changed that. He brought all seven groups together and told them, what are you thinking? We need to uh, immunize our children. They're here to do good for us. And with his efforts, all seven groups accepted us in, and we were actually welcomed in like rock stars, literally. Um, wherever we went, we were, had our backs patted, we were thanked, we had our hands shake, shaken. Uh, it, it, was, it was tremendous what this one gentleman did. You notice also he has a shawl on, and fascinating part of that is that when I went and met the gentleman, he shook my hand. When he met my wife, he actually took that black cloak and covered his hand and shook her hand with the cloak between because he is not allowed to touch a, a woman's skin, skin to skin. So that's what that black coat, uh, cloak actually did for him. And this is his grandson. His son, by the way, and the child's father is a doctor. These are the drops, two drops for each child. Um, this is one of the team members, uh, Cheryl. Uh, she's from the uh, Oregon area and she was with the team. Uh, I took a picture of this because so many people talk about this as Rotarians being what changed their life, administering those drops. This is a picture of my wife doing the same thing also, um, also doing the immunization process of that. 
And uh, it, it is truly uh, heartwarming knowing that you are saving this child. Not only because uh, we looked at paralysis of, of the limbs, but we also have to realize that that paralysis could also be of the, um, the body, the thorax area. It could actually uh, kill people because you can't breathe. It'll actually shut down a heart also because that is also part of a muscle. This is a picture of myself doing one on a train that came by. And uh, if you've seen the movies of trains in India, it is no different. This train is definitely a train from India. Um, I'm immunizing a child from the, the uh, window because I could not get into that train. I couldn't literally not walk through. It was bumper to bumper people. Um, so I did it through there. Now what's fascinating is that I actually only immunized two children on that entire trip. Um, our job, our mission as Rotarians from the United States is actually to be a PR uh, tool. We have to thank those people, and that is our job, to thank those people in India for all they did. Some of these people had volunteered for 12 years uh, with very little pay, if anything, immunizing children. The least we could do is acknowledge them. Another thing is I could do one or two in maybe a minute if I'm really lucky. The team that's there, the ones from India, could actually do hundreds, hundreds of them in an hour. Uh, they're, they're amazing. And so we were just in their way. I put this picture in because we actually went out into the, one of the villages. This, uh, this boy here is coming in out of the fields. And those are, uh, I will call them cow pies. Uh, they're actually from buffaloes. And they use those for fuel for eating, for the, cooking their food. And also, they put them on their house as part of insulation. So part, part of the developing country and something very unique that uh, we wouldn't think about doing. Picture of uh, one of the villages we went to. This is uh, my wife and one of the other members of our team along with the team of uh, polio fighters from, from India itself. Uh, as you can see, we were kind of like the Pied Pipers. People followed us everywhere. This picture here, uh, Roxanne, my wife, and myself actually went to what, that same village, and we met uh, one of the children that had the polio virus that had contracted that literally only months before we got there. The unfortunate part, as you could see, um, we, we saw this child. He was about two years old, uh, couldn't walk. He, he was already to a point to where his legs were, were, were limp. The mother showed by putting him down on the ground that the minute his feet touched the ground, he would cry in pain, and, and that's polio. Fortunately. This was one of the last cases in that city of Muradabad, and that was very touching, seeing all of the ones that were well, yet seeing that one that was stricken by the disease, because we don't see it here. These other pictures are different people. This is a 19-year-old uh, son of the um, chief of that village, and nobody knew that his, this chief even had a son that had polio because he had kept him hidden for so long. Um, in India, some of the cultures outside consider this taboo. You, you know, you will no longer be a community leader if you have a child that's been stricken by polio because it is, quote, a curse. And so he hid his child for 19 years. Unfortunately, at some point in time, uh, this young man was probably contagious. And one of the reasons why other children in that village contracted the disease. Another picture. This is a gentleman here that um, is stricken also by polio. Now, we will never, fortunately, see this in the United States. Unfortunately, we do see this in a lot of other developing countries. I put this picture out there because so many people hear of polio, yet have no idea what we are talking about. Well, this is the true answer. This is what polio is, uh, the face of it. And this gentleman here will be um, spending the rest of his life begging on the streets. 14-year-old child, one of the things that Rotary also does is pay for corrective surgery. So you don't have people like the gentleman in the previous photo. This girl here will actually have her legs straightened out where she could run pretty much and do a normal life. She'll have a job, uh, she'll be able to work, and uh, will have minimal effects from polio. This picture here is uh, one of the children that we immunized, and you'll notice she uh, is putting out a, a pinky, showing the pinky, which has an indelible purple ink on it. We use a marker pen. Every child that is immunized will have the pinky finger marked, and that will not come off for three to six months. So if we walk down a street, we ask them see, to see all the children's hands, they actually will show us then their pinky finger, and that pinky will then tell us, yes, in fact, they were immunized, or no, they were missed, because that is how it goes on. 
those uh, markers are actually protected by the government of India because they want to make sure that somebody doesn't put those uh, marks on and not get immunized. When I came back, one of the uh, opportunities I had was to be at San Luis Obispo at their film festival. And at that film festival, we had uh, the Salks there. This is Jonathan and Peter Salk, uh, whose father, Jonas Salk, came up with one of the vaccines for polio in the, uh, in the 50s. So um, I, I had the opportunity to talk to them. One thing fascinating about this meeting was that they told me that at one point in time, one of the um, universities that was making the, um, the serum, doing, doing the polio eradication uh, serums, actually had a bad batch come through. And that bad batch eventually um, infected, I believe, as many as 18,000 children on the West Coast. Surprisingly enough, that was about the same time I had contracted the polio virus. So it may, in fact, have been a partially um, treated um, polio uh, vaccine that, I, that had affected me. Another picture here was uh, with a group here. I have uh, Peter Salk with me and uh, the, the lady all sitting on the other side, uh, opposite side seated, is actually Debbie Sabin, whose father, uh, Albert Sabin, was also a, a member that did the, quote, competing vaccine. And I got them two, those two together and uh, we actually had them running on a float during the Rose Parade as polio awareness. This is what we look at. Um, currently, currently, these, these are the numbers. Our hopes, uh, as far as Rotary is concerned, is that we go ahead and try and get polio eradicated from the world by the year 2018. Very optimistic. One thing that we take a look at are the numbers. As you recall, um, 1985, 350,000 cases. We are down now to about 18. Um, endemic countries are only two. Um, five years ago, were India and Nigeria were on that list. They have since been uh, eradicated from them. We have Pakistan and Afghanistan. So I wanted to bring you awareness of what polio and our efforts as Rotarians are, because you're gonna be asked on occasion to help donate to the cause. This is a huge cause, as much as $10 billion. Again, the largest humanitarian effort ever put forth uh, in mankind and our history. With that, um, I hope you learned something uh, about polio and, its, and the vaccines itself, what Rotarians and Rotary is doing, partnering up with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We hope to have this eradicated by the year 2018. With that, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you learned something. Thank you.